That's what we're about here. We're not about great preachers and great people and great buildings and great works and great this and great that. We're about the Lord Jesus. If you have your Bible, turn to Isaiah chapter 14 with me this morning, please. Isaiah chapter number 14. Verse number 4. Isaiah chapter number 14, verse 4. That thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, How hath the oppressor ceased, the golden city ceased? The Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he that ruled the nations in anger, is persecuted and none hindereth. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee, and the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since thou art laid down, no feller is come up against thee, uh, us rather. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. All they, all they, all they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as us? Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials, the worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. How art thou fallen from heaven? O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit, they that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble and did shake kingdoms? Father, bless your holy word. Now as it goes forth, anoint it into the hearts and the hearing of the people. In thy holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. There's a great deal of controversy about the 14th chapter of Isaiah. In verse number 4, it's addressed to the king of Babylon. And some say that that's it. That's as far as it goes. It's the king of Babylon. But the king of Babylon did not fall from heaven. And the speech here in chapter number 14 is a much loftier, higher speech that, could, that would apply to some creature that is far greater than simply some earthly kingdom. For this one said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be brought... I will be like the Most High, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. In Isaiah chapter number 14, we have here Lucifer. Lucifer is the name of Satan. The name in Latin means light bearer. The 14th chapter of the book of Isaiah is a sacred text to the occult world. For the occult world, believe me this morning, worships and exalts Lucifer far above our Lord Jesus Christ. To them, he is God. To them, he is the manifestation of that great spirit being. That great spirit being is not a good word. That great spirit mind that is in control of everything. There's a spirit in here this morning. And that's since it just started when I read the scripture. My Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I come against this spirit. I plead the blood of Christ against this power that is settled down upon this congregation. Lord, you know I come in the name of the Lord. I'm just a man. I'm a messenger. and That's all I am. I have no authority over Satan. I am certainly not his match. But I belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the name of my Lord Jesus Christ this morning and by the power of the blood covenant at Calvary, I break the power of hell that comes against this sermon. 
and against this congregation. I know he hates what I'm about to preach. In Jesus' sweet and blessed and holy name I pray now. Lord, give me liberty, and I'll bless you and praise you forever. In thy name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Isaiah chapter number 14. The enemy is the devil. He's Lucifer. He's the light bearer. There is in this world an occult world that has rejected the word of God. They have completely and totally rejected the revelation of scripture. I would recommend for you, if you were not in Sunday school this morning, I would highly, highly, highly recommend that you get the tape from Sunday school this morning. You'll find that it will complement what I'm saying in the message as I preach it from Isaiah chapter number 14. You'll find if you listen to that tape this morning from Sunday school that it will cover many things that will help you understand what we're going to get into when I, when I delve deeper into the message today. But just leave it to say, suffice it to say this right now, that Lucifer is the God of this world. And as the God of this world, he is in charge of what's happening in this world. Only to a point where it not for the restraining power of the Holy Spirit of God, Lucifer could do as he pleased. He could run wild far to and fro. As the book of Job says, where hast thou been? Walking to and fro, he said in the book of Job chapter number one. But the Lord constrains him. He restrains him. He holds him in. This is why that you have yet to see break loose on this earth things that will literally scare men and women to death. They will be seeking death and death will flee from them. We are on the verge of that. I cannot express to you enough this morning the idea that we are living in the end of the end. It's about over, folks. And I feel such a weight this morning upon my soul. There is such a burden upon me. I feel the gravity of this pulpit, of this ministry, of where I am. This is not a cheap thing. This is not an easy thing. This is war. And God knows that I have declared war against my enemy. And he knows that. And he despises me with everything that is in him. But praise be to God today. When I stand before you in this pulpit, I stand on the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. I know whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. Now in this world, they want a one world government. They want a one world spirit. They believe that there's a one mind that controls everything. And they believe that if they can meditate enough, think enough, and take enough dope and drugs and so forth, that they can connect with that mind. And by connecting with that mind, it makes them stronger. It makes them greater. It gives them power. We're talking about the religious elite that are running this world. The average man on the street, the only thing he cares about is his six pack and sex. He's got his bread and his circuses. That's all they care about. That's all most people care about. They want to be entertained and they want to just to lay back and enjoy life and just let, the, let it flow as it's gonna flow. The truth of the matter is that most people that go to the church house, that's their attitude. And most of the reverends that are in the pulpit, that's their attitude too. But I got no choice. I made a choice. My choice is the Lord God. I chose to stand with him. I chose to preach his word. And I chose and I choose by the grace of God this morning to finish my course and end it here and do it right until the last breath I draw in my body. For the thing that matters most to me is the fact that I will stand and preach the truth to you until I'm done and I'm finished. And he says, come home. You're finished. You finished your course. Now that's what matters to me. I don't know about you. Some of you may want to retire, go off in the bushes somewhere, sit down and let the world go on as it pleases. I can't do that. That's death and hell for me. The only reason that I continue in this world is because I've got a place to preach and teach and minister God's holy word. That's why I am here. So I called my enemy on the carpet today. He understands and he knows which side I'm on. He knows who I am and he knows what I preach. And what I'm about to preach to you today may blow your mind. They believe the earth is a living thing. Carl Jung taught, and he is a so-called psychologist, that the subconscious mind must get in touch with this universal mind. And by doing so, great power and authority can be released in the individual. They believe that the earth is alive. They believe that it has its own spirit, its own life, its own mind. This is why there's such a move today of the ecology movement, where they're preserving the earth, about the earth, about the earth, about the earth. My dear friend, let me tell you something about the earth. It's 
it's going to burn and it's going to melt with fervent heat. And the Bible says this about the earth. It is his footstool. So imagine what he thinks about the earth. No, dear friend, I don't worship this earth. And it is not my mother. But they believe in a state of enlightenment. The occult world wants to be enlightened. They want to know more. They want to understand more. They want to know what God Almighty was talking about in the book of Genesis when that serpent came and said, God doth know. What is it that God doth know? These occultists, the elitists, the ones who are running the world, folks, and the ones who are running the world are not the people you see on the TV screens. They come, they go. The ones running this world are in the background and they are literally pulling the strings and moving the puppets as they please. You can watch people go into the office of president and if you will observe, you will see them begin to transform. And the reason they do is because they have no concept of the power and authority and pressure that's going to come down upon their shoulders from the ones who are pulling the strings. You need to pray for the man in the office of president right now. He needs your prayer. But keep this in mind. The God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. Let the, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The average American is as blind as a bat when it comes to spiritual things. My prayer today, Lord God, open their eyes. They believe in a world where a third eye can be opened. That third eye will give them vision into the spirit world. It will allow them to see auras around the human body. It will allow them to see mist as it moves about. It will allow them to see the spirits. It will give them, it will give them unbelievable power and authority if they can open up that third eye. If you've ever done any research or read anything or seen anything that has to do with history and idols, you'll see an eye planted right in the center of the forehead. That is the third eye connected with the pineal gland in the back of the head, connected with a serpent that coils up and rises up the spine, the kundalini power that is reached by yoga when people sit in a yoga state and there they contact the spirit world. Isn't it a Shame that you got churches all over this country where they have yoga classes. The churches are teaching yoga to the people. My friend, let me tell you something, and this may sound like a shocker to you, but please hear me. If you want to go to hell, go to most of the churches in the country. It is the door to hell. For when you walk into that house, you're walking into a house, my friend, that is nothing in the world more than a satanic, luciferian initiates, a bunch of people that have no clue about what the word of God says. If I don't preach the Bible to you, Correct me. Show me when I get outside of the scripture and then we'll know what's going on. An enlightened state. A third eye. One of the greatest enlightened ones according to the occult world is Hermes Trismegistus. Hermes Trismegistus. They believe that he is the greatest enlightened one. Some do. He would be what's called the thrice greatest. He's a combination of the great god Hermes and the Egyptian god Thoth. They consider him to be the most powerful wizard in history. He wrote the Emerald Tablet. Put that in your mind, the Emerald Tablet. This book appeared about 400 AD. Tradition has it that a soldier under Alexander the Great, Alexander the Great found this tablet in the hands of a mummy. And that mummy was Hermes Trismegistus. This tablet is so important because what the tablet says is that there is a wisdom from God, that there's an understanding that can be attained. There is knowledge that is there, but it does not come from the Holy Bible. 
Are you following me? Gnosticism taught the same thing. They taught that the book has words in it, but the real message comes by contacting the spirit of this great universal mind. Gnosticism has affected so many of the new translations of the Bible. That's why they're called Gnostic Bibles from the Gnostic Gospels. I know that makes a lot of people mad, but the King James Bible is an odd book for every other book on this earth. Why? Because that book will change your life. That book right there will affect you in ways that no other book can. It will tell you about the true Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ. Hermes Trimagistus therefore becomes the granddaddy of the occult world. Not all of them, but most of them. Uh, hermeticism today of the occult world, the Kabbalah of the occult world, Gnosticism of the occult world, all of this stuff is connected with the great wizard that lived in the past. I make a choice today. Either I choose Hermes Trismegistus or I choose Moses that wrote the Pentateuch. I either make a choice between the wisdom of this world, the wisdom of the occult world, or the word of the living God. Now listen carefully to me. You're living in a transition period. Please listen to this preacher. You're living in a transition period. You're living in a period where you're going to have to make a decision. Are you receive the truth or will you reject it? Second Thessalonians 2 says, because they love not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. For this cause, God will send them a strong delusion that they might believe a lie and be damned. This is your generation. Your generation before you didn't have to make that choice, but you do. And the choice is laid before your very feet right now, today, in this, in this congregation. I preached a little about the shack last week. The Shack was a book written about a decade ago, and now it has become a movie. This is pure poison, but it is being bought wife wildfire in the churches. People are lapping it up like it's some great message from God. I want to tell you a little bit about the Shack, but hear me well. Hear me well. If you choose to follow the way of the Shack and the God that's revealed in the Shack, if you choose to follow that God, you've made your choice. And by making your choice, you will receive a strong delusion and you will be damned. Amen. You say, can it be that different, preacher? Can it be that? Yes, it can be. Because let me tell you about the God of the shack. Would you hear me now? The book of the, the shack talks about God being in everything. He's in this. He's in that. He's here. He's there. That's pantheism. Then when God shows up in the shack... He shows up as a female, as a black female. Now, listen carefully. This is not to run black folk down. I have no intentions of standing up here this morning before you and appearing as a racist. Has nothing to do with that. This goes way back before that. How many of you remember the message I preached about the Chartres Cathedral? I taught it in Sunday school. How many of you remember that I talked to you about the black Madonna that was underneath in a Christian cathedral, so-called. How many of you remember that I told you that that black Madonna was sitting at what's called the womb of the earth? Now, here we have a depiction of God in the shack as a female, a black female. Now, I guarantee you, by saying this publicly, people will run out and say, Lawson's a racist. I am not a racist. I am trying to tell you what the book says. They're changing the very nature of God. God, my friend, is an eternal, absolute, almighty, invisible being that is from everlasting to everlasting. 2,000 years ago, God was manifest in this world and became incarnate as a man. The man, Christ Jesus, not the woman, Christ Jesus. The man, Christ Jesus. Now, this generation today, has been so brainwashed that any time you deviate in any way from the populist idea about anything, they've got a brand that they'll stick on you. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. I'm a misogynist now. Not only am I a racist, I'm a misogynist. What's that? That means that I elevate the male gender above the female gender. Notice how that they got a tag for you. You see this generation today... They don't think about anything. They just follow tags. That's all. They read labels. 
That's right. They read labels. That's all they're interested in is labels. They couldn't care less about what anything really means. And so now I'm a bigot too. <laughs> I'm a bigot. I'm a misogynist. And I am a racist. Here's what's happening. When I get up and preach something like this to you, the reason that the average preacher will not preach something like this to you is for the very reason I gave you this. It's because by the time you get done, people are going to have you labeled and they're going to turn around and walk out the door because the devil has brainwashed them completely to the point where they reject the truth. How many of you believe that God Almighty is a man? Well, as preacher, I believe he's both male and female. Sure, you're androgynous. And you're running around with the occult crowd out there right now that's trying to destroy the very foundation of our culture with transgenderism. And the idea that male and female, that you can be both. And you cannot be both. But do you follow me? I'm trying to make a point with you. And here's my point. Please listen to what I'm saying. If the only thing you know about gender and about God and about the theology of who God is, he's not in things, he made things. But if all you know is what you're picking up from this, from this popular culture, the way the world defines stuff in this country, you are messed up. You are messed up completely because the Bible no longer means anything to you. You take the Bible and you hold it up and you examine it in the light of your culture today. Folks, 2017 American culture is this. This. It's as sick as it can be when it comes to the Holy Bible. But you've got to make a choice. And so if you choose to embrace the shack and its New Age teachings and its New Age doctrine, then you have made your choice where you are rejecting the truth and you are embracing a lie and God's going to send you a strong delusion and you'll be condemned because of it. And let me tell you, think about it for a minute. This is 2017. How long do you think it's going to be before the Antichrist shows up? If this kind of stuff is already being pumped into the churches and the churches are accepting it, the church house today will accept anything, anything in the name of God. You call it whatever you want to. They'll accept it. So where are we? Now think about that for a minute. The emerald tablet that Hermes Trismegistus had in his hands, he received from Lucifer. Turn to Ezekiel chapter number 28 and verse number 11. This emerald tablet that has all of this great wisdom on it was originally part of Lucifer, according to them. Now look at your Bible in Ezekiel 28, verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation the king of Tyrus, and say to him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Watch this. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, sapphire, emerald, and carbuncle. Emerald and carbuncle. Emerald and carbuncle. Gold, the workmanship of thy tablets, of thy paps, prepared in thee in the day thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. They say Lucifer was kicked out and fell and from his body came an emerald stone and Hermes Trismegistus had this stone with the engraving in it of the great wisdom from the universal mind and that by receiving this emerald stone, you can receive light and enlightenment from the great universal mind. And by doing that, you've been elevated above the crowd, the herd, and that's who we are. Because we Christians are superstitious. 
We Christians are backward. We Christians are ignorant because we believe in a book that was written by a bunch of Jews hundreds of years ago, and we need to plug in to the spirit that's moving among men today. That's what they're saying. That's very appealing, especially to millennials. Who's a millennial? A millennial is anybody from the ages of about 18 up to about 25, 26. These millennials are naturally inquisitive. They want to know what's going on. Most millennials have never seen a revival meeting in their life. Most people that go to church houses have never seen revival. A revival meeting, a real revival, a real, real revival meeting is a manifestation of the power of God through the Holy Ghost in such a way that it'll get, take a hold of you for the rest of your life and you'll never be the same again. They've never seen that. They're inquisitive. They want to know what's going on. And this is the kind of thing that reaches them because they believe that you're out of touch anyway as an old fogey and so your Bible's out of touch anyway as an old fogey. So they're going to come along and they're going to get the latest spiritual revelations that come down the pike. And that's what they're getting today. Because all of this new stuff that's being introduced into the churches appeals to them like labyrinths, like contemplative prayers, like whispered prayers, like all of this stuff that's coming now that's so most of you folks that are my age, you've never heard of this stuff. You don't know anything about it. But the younger generation does. And they're receiving it. And by receiving it, they're going to receive damnation if the truth is not preached to them. And they don't get it. And that's what's happening. The church is not preaching it and nobody's getting it. That's such a sad thing. So this is a fragment of the jewel that Lucifer lost. And it's got this wisdom on it. And they accept this because this is coming from this great universal mind. And the churches today, the preachers that get up in the churches, are telling people it's okay, you can go to the shack, you can read the shack, you can read Da Vinci's Code, you can take God any way you want to because God is the same to everybody. Everybody's going to be okay. Universal salvation. You can even be an atheist or an agnostic and still go to heaven. It doesn't make any difference whatsoever. Everything's going to be just fine. And that sounds good to a narcissistic generation. So what kind of a generation is that? That's people who think about nothing but themselves. Do you know why half of the marriages end in divorce? Because when the two people come together, they think they're going to make a marriage, but essentially what they do is join two people together that are completely separate and identify themselves, and all they think about is themselves, and, and, and eventually the new wears off, and it's over. That's what's happening to our marriages today. When you find somebody that's been married 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years, you're finding an oddity in this generation today. Amen. And that's so sad because they've destroyed the foundation and the foundation of society is the home. They've destroyed it. Yes, it's gone. Yes, and a whole generation of young people are out here just floating around from place to place with no root, with no foundation, with no mom and no dad, with nothing because it's all been destroyed Amen. by this culture. And when you go to your church house, the churches make you very comfortable and make you feel good because of a situation like that. You should be comforted and you should feel good when the Holy Ghost comforts you and makes you feel good in the will of God. Right. And we need comforting and we need to feel good. We need to feel right with God. Amen. But you cannot, if you're living like hell itself, running from God, living in sin. If you can feel good in a situation like that with God, you got the wrong God. We got a big problem going on. Now I've got tablets, but mine aren't uh, emerald tablets. My tablets were written by the finger of God. They're called the Ten Commandments. I've got a spirit, and that spirit is the Holy Ghost. 
What if he doesn't give me some kind of a thing where I can read auras and I can, I can see spirits and all of that? Every once in a while, you'll see a spirit when it manifests itself to you and makes itself known to you. Otherwise, you don't have the ability to look into the spirit world. The spirit world's real. I don't want to look into the spirit world. I thank God that I've got the truth this morning. That I've been born again. Thank God that I know that I'm not of this world because they don't want anything to do with me. And the last thing I want to do is be accepted by this world. Amen. Do any part of it? I don't want any part. I've lived too long. I've lived too long. I've gotten to the point now where stuff has really begun to fade away with me. The only thing that really matters to me is the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, the Lord God, talking to Him, praying to Him. Reading his word and fellowship with him, walking with him, communing with God. Boy, there's so much more in that than there is in stuff. I know you need stuff, but stuff, stuff. It'll never make you happy. Never satisfy the soul. Satan fought me today. I've worked all week on this. I wanted my I tried my best to get up and somehow or another make you understand how urgent the time is. This is the point. If you don't get anything else out of this message, get this. Get this part. You are right now living in the time when you're going to make a decision about which way you're going to go. If you follow the shack crowd, you're going into the new age, you're going into the occult world, and you're going into taking the mark. And you're going into damnation. I beg you in the name of Jesus, pick up the old book. Read the old book. Get on your knees and pray. Ask God to be merciful to you, a sinner, and save you, and write your name in heaven. Forgive you of your sins. Cover you by the blood. In Jesus' name, take that path. That's the right path. That's the right way. Anything else is damnation. Which way are you going to take today? Are you going to follow the crowd? Because that's the crowd. The minority is going to take this way. We're going to take the way of the book. Father, in Jesus' name, I've delivered what you gave me. I've, I've emptied my soul. Now, I pray you'd use this this morning, Lord. I pray you'd use it for the glory of God. I'm clear of it now. The burden's gone. I've done my part. I pray, Holy One, now. Let you do whatever you want to do with this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand up this morning.